Okay, go ahead. Okay. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. Uh, I will be presenting on hemiplegic migraines today. Uh, as we all know, migraines cause episodes of severe headache, debilitating symptoms. And when it strikes, uh, the patients are really taken off for the majority of their day. This is a very large public health problem. Uh, with more than 39 million Americans suffering from migraines. Every day. And it comes with anxiety and sleep disturbances. Unfortunately, there aren't enough headache specialists in the United States, and roughly there are around 2,000 healthcare providers that have interest in uh, headache. And with over 39 million people suffering with migraine, there is a unique uh, lack of uh, specialists in the country, and wait times can often be long. And by the time the patients get their diagnosis, it can take some time. Today, uh, I'll be discussing on hemiplegic migraines, which, as I mentioned, is rare and a serious type of migraine. Yeah, so I'd like to start the presentation uh, with a case. Uh, it's about a 20-year-old woman who presented to our clinic with history of chronic migraines. And uh, around one week before she presented to the clinic, she had severe headache, which was around 9 out of 10 intensity. Uh, it was described by her as a pressure-like sensation located in her forehead and her bitemporal region. It was associated with nausea, and she had weakness over the left side of her body. Uh, she had weakness over the right side of her face. She had difficulty walking. She had vision disturbances and difficulty speaking, uh, which was uh, reported by her friends uh, as uh, they couldn't understand what she was saying. Uh, her uh, symptoms persisted for about 30 minutes, and she was evaluated at the local ER, where an MRI and CD were taken. Both the results came back as normal. Uh, she was started on prednisone, prochlorpyrazine, and diazepam, and she was told to come back to a neurologist just in case her symptoms persisted, uh, which uh, she, uh, clearly did because she started experiencing daily headache, which was 5 out of 10 intensity. And uh, unlike her usual migraine headaches, it did not stop with uh, azetaminophen or ibuprofen. Uh, she uh, gave a history of sleep disturbances recently due to stress at work. Uh, here are a list of symptoms we are, uh, which we ask usually in history to rule out the common differential diagnosis. Uh, so it wasn't associated with lacrimation, nasal stuffiness, no conjunctival injection, there was no facial swelling, so cluster headache can be ruled out. Uh, there was no excess uh, caffeine uh, intake. Her headache did not worsen with waltz hour, no change with coughing, laughing, or sneezing. There was no seasonal variation, no movement or activity worsened her headache. She did not have any relieving factors. There was no reduction or increase with lying down or posture. There was no history of neck stiffness, no decreased range of motion in her neck, so we ruled out a meningitis. There was no uh, uh, source of infection as she did not have any fever, chills, or night sweats. No sore throat, no weight loss, no cough, no chest pain, no history of head trauma in the past, no history of recent travel. Uh, her past medical history, as I mentioned earlier, she had headaches since she was 13 years old. And one thing she said uh, was she often noticed a uh, relation with her menstrual cycle. Uh, she was on the second day of her menstrual cycle when this uh, headache happened. And uh, another significant history was she had a COVID-19 infection in January 2020, and her only symptom during the infection was headache. And since then, she's been having uh, severe headaches. And she says that she's she described a, a routine brain fog, and she has difficulty in concentrating and focusing. Uh, she's originally from Germany, and she works as an executive assistant. She has no history of sexually transmitted infection. And another history is she has a history of use of oral contraceptive pills for more than 10 years. And uh, I'm going to be coming to that, why that history is important, because hormone changes in women can is often a trigger for headaches. She is currently using an intrauterine device for contraception. Her vaccinations are up to date. There was no allergies. She doesn't drink alcohol uh, every day. She's an occasional drinker. She does not smoke or use any kind of illicit drugs. Uh, and another history is that she has no family history of any kind of headaches or stroke. 
her uh, on examination her vitals were stable her neck was uh, neck examination was normal no lymph lymphopathy her cranial nerve examinations were okay and her mental status and her language and speech were perfectly fine when we saw her her motor examination was five by five in all her muscle groups reflexes were two by four and uh, the only uh, significant finding we noticed was she had a reduced sensation over the right side of her face which she says that has become better over the days but we could still uh, find some reduced sensation over the right side of her face and she had no difficulty in walking her gait was perfectly normal with this i would like to introduce our topic for today hemiplegic migraine uh, the primary feature that describes or differentiate this kinds of these kind of migraines from other migraines is that uh, it has hemiplegia as a motor aura, and usually uh, the migraine auras are frequently described as either sensory, verbal, and motor disturbances are very rare, and hence hemiplegic migraine is an uncommon subtype but a very serious subtype because of the uh, the patients often come with a lot of anxiety and they're really worried. Why, why is it happening? They often think that they have a stroke because uh, even though it is a migraine, it's associated with a weakness and often it can lead to ataxia, loss of consciousness, and in worst case, it can even lead to seizures and coma. And uh, what we notice that uh, typically is these neurological deficits last for maybe a few hours. It can even go up to days. And early adolescent age group is a common age group that we see and uh, particularly females are are uh, pr you know, uh, predominantly affected and the symptoms overlap often with uh, brainstem aura. And uh, in this uh, discussion, we'll be looking at the pathophysiology, the clinical features, diagnosis and management of the two common type of hemiplegic migraines that are described, which are the familial and the sporadic type. Uh, familial is of three types, one, two, and three. I've uh, given the genes that are commonly associated with these. It's hard to remember these, but I just want to tell you that these genes are responsible for the calcium channels and sodium and potassium channels. And that is which leads to the depolarization, repolarization, and the following hyperexcitability, et cetera, which is the main cause of these kind of, kind of migraines. And uh, the incidence, uh, the, the mode of transmission is autosomal dominant, and around 50%, uh, there's a 50% chance that uh, the, the children of an affected parent can transmit to the, this to the next generation. Uh, sporadic my, uh, hemiplegic migraine is when uh, the patient is the first member in the family to get it. Uh, just like I mentioned, the pathophysiology, as shown in the picture, it starts, uh, it's, it's a cortical spreading depression. It starts at the back of the brain and slowly uh, moves to the front of the brain. And um, uh, as, we, uh, as we all know, uh, that this is a very common uh, uh, theory behind migraines, and it is the same for uh, hemiplegic migraines as well. And um, uh, it starts at the back of the brain, like a uh, wave of repolarization followed by depolarization. And this was all done by the potassium channels, the sodium and uh, sodium channels, the calcium channels are all responsible for the repolarization and the depolarization, which leads to these kind of migraines. The other uh, postulate is that neurogenic inflammation caused by the cytokines, uh, mainly COX-2, NF-kappa beta, the interleukins uh, 1 beta, 6 tumor necrosis factor alpha. These are all the uh, you know, cytokines and the chemicals that are responsible for migraines as well. And the activation of the trigeminal vascular pathway is described as the main cause for the headache. The epidemiology is, uh, as I mentioned, is a rare disorder. There has, there has been several studies. Usually, uh, you know, what we see is a one in 10,000 in, uh, incidents uh, all over the world. And this is from a study that was done in Denmark. And uh, both the uh, types of uh, hemiplegic migraine occur with equal prevalence. Uh, age of onset is roughly between 12 to 17, early adolescent age group, as I mentioned earlier. And females have a higher uh, predisposition uh, factor for uh, developing these kind of migraines. And, yeah, and sometimes these are associated with other neurological conditions like chronic cerebellar ataxia and epilepsy. Uh, clinical manifestations, it can vary. Uh, it can start uh, with the aura and followed by a severe headache, visual field effects, numbness, paresthesia. It can lead to a face lift, just like this patient we saw. It can even lead to coma and seizures. And uh, it can last for a few hours. It can resolve completely. And both the types of migraines are clinically indistinguishable. They manifest similarly. Uh, the frequency and triggers, usually these patients get around three attacks per year. 
and after they are around 50, the number of attacks tend to come down. And the usual stressors are acute stress, just like our patient mentioned. She's an executive assistant and she has, she has been having a lot of stress and sleep problems. Uh, that could have led uh, to this episode in the patient. So acute stress is a cause, bright light, intense emotions, uh, too much or too little sleep, exertion, and mild head trauma can also cause these. Uh, the aura is just like I mentioned, it's the motor aura that stands out and it tends to uh, happen over around half an hour and uh, it can it can take hours to gradually improve. And the aura symptoms, uh, so uh, these kind of migraines have an overlap with the basilar type of migraines. So occasionally patients can have vertigo, uh, dysarthria, ataxia, and sensor, motor, and visual symptoms. Hearing uh, disturbances like hyperacusis, they can have ringing in their ear and can also lead to diminished consciousness in the most severe expression of the disease. And usually the motor symptoms start in the hand and gradually spread upwards. And uh, the, the unilateral features can switch sides, uh, which is very interesting to know. And the degree of motor weakness can be mild to severe. Uh, the headache, uh, usually, uh, just like how we say, if, uh, if a tension headache is like a mosquito bite, the patients with migraine describe it as a shark bite. I am not sure if anybody has been bitten by a shark ever, but they say it's really, really bad. And, uh, and the headache usually occurs uh, during the aura, and it can either be bilateral or unilateral. Uh, the other symptoms and signs, usually during an attack, we can elicit a positive pregnancy scan. And uh, in between attacks, usually the patients have a normal neurological uh, examination, just like how we saw in this patient. And severe attacks can lead to visual, sensory, motor, aphasic, and brainstem auras, worst case, encephalopathy or coma. Uh, in rare instances, it has led to permanent brain injury, cerebral infarction, and cerebral atrophy. Uh, clinical diagnosis, uh, the diagnosis of this type of migraine is entirely clinical and genetic testing is not necessary. And although it looks pretty straightforward, the determination is very challenging because the patients usually confuse or misinterpret their symptoms as ataxia or a stroke, or they say if they've been having numbness. So it's really hard to make the association between the headache and the clinical symptoms. Uh, usually these symptoms uh, are what we describe as a fully reversible motor weakness. It never persists. It's a fully re reversible speech, language, visual, or a sensory symptom. So the symptoms are fully reversible. That's the biggest take home from this slide. And uh, the, uh, the other part of the diagnosis is to exclude the other causes of similar headache. Like you have to exclude a head trauma, you have to exclude vascular disorders, uh, other intracranial disorders and you know, infections and even a transient ischemic attack is also a common differential. So uh, diagnostic criteria is based on exclusion. And the International Classification of Headache Disorders, the third edition describes the diagnostic criteria. So they say there should be at least two attacks fulfilling the criteria of migraine with aura. And uh, the aura, just like I mentioned, should be a fully reversible motor weakness and a fully reversible visual, sensory, and speech and language symptom. And it should not be accounted by another ICD diagnosis. The differential diagnosis uh, uh, or common ones are a transient ischemic attack or a stroke. Uh, that should be the first major differential. It can also come as a thoughts paralysis. That is a seizure with post-ictal paralysis syndrome. Uh, there's a condition called as alternating, uh, alternating hyper hemiplegia of childhood, which also is a common differential uh, when it happens to children. Uh, the other infections and then a, a, a very rare, again, uh, disease is uh, the Mela syndrome or the mitochondrial encephalopathy, lactic acidosis and stroke-like syndrome. Uh, we have to rule that out and uh, very rarely even metabolic disorders and, uh, and a hereditary condition called a Sturge Weber syndrome is also described as a differential. Uh, the management is just like how we manage a typical migraine. Uh, there is preventive therapy, there is abortive therapy, and uh, if it's severe attacks, patients often require hospitalization and additional measures. And, uh, and there's uh, there are no randomized controlled trials of therapy it's specifically designed for hemiplegic migraine, but uh, there are a couple of case reports uh, if you guys want to uh, look it up, uh, it's available. And the first line uh, options are uh, 
parapanel app, which is usually used for frequent or prolonged aura. And uh, these doses are hard to remember, but I just put them in just in case. Uh, and uh, one report said that uh, for patients who were treated with varipamil had significant resolution of attacks and almost near complete resolution and reduction in attack frequency and severity. So we know that it's a good drug. Uh, even uh, in patients with headache predominant uh, conditions, funarazine, topiramate, or amitriptyline is used. And uh, since the hemiplegic migraine is a subset of migraine, even preventive medication commonly used to uh, treat typical migraines with aura are uh, usual, usually used and beneficial in these patients. Uh, and hemiplegic familial type, uh, it's interesting to note that acetosolamide has a very good uh, effective uh, reports on treating the patients with familial hemiplegic migraines. And just like I mentioned, these are all channelopathies. So uh, hence we know that acetosolamide, which works on the channels in our body, can definitely help the patients with these kind of migraines. And the decision to continue the treatment is up to the patient, and it's again dependent on the frequency and severity of attacks and patient preferences. Uh, so that is uh, depending on the patient and the clinician who is treating. And other lifestyle changes that can be advised is diet modifications, exercise, management of stress, healthy sleep patterns, and trigger identification. We cannot stress on these points enough because this alone has caused significant changes in some patients. Uh, acute management of severe attacks may require hospitalization, just like I said, and may require injection medications like corticosteroids. So drugs that are generally avoid, avoided are tryptans, ergotamine derivatives, beta blockers, uh, intravenous calcium channel blockers, etc. because there's often a theory which says that migraines happen because of cerebral vasoconstriction, and these drugs are uh, critical in causing those. So these drugs are generally avoided in these patients with hemiplegic migraine. Prognosis is uh, pretty good, and nearly all patients have a complete resolution of symptoms and some patients have it prolonged. Rare cases, just like I mentioned, can cause neurological deficits, infarction, cognitive decline, and even organ death. Uh, so, and many such patients have phenotypes that are characterized by early onset of hemiplegic migraine, and, you know, early in the adolescent or even, even with, as a child. And, uh, the, and the frequency of attacks uh, falls after 50 years, and it can either evolve into other kind of migraines uh, without hemiparesis as well. Uh, I would like to quickly touch on me menstrual migraines since our patient also mentioned a relationship with their menstrual cycles. Uh, so menstrually associated migraine or catamenial migraine, and it it's, occurs in close association with menstruation. And the time period is usually two to three days before or through the menstrual cycle. And, uh, and uh, they can also have migraines at the other times of the month, but usually they report an association. The pathophysiology is, again, the similar uh, conditions with uh, estrogen causing an increase in cytokines, uh, calcitonin gene-related peptides, and pros other prostaglandins. Uh, another interesting question that usually patients can ask us is, can patients with migraine use uh, estrogen-containing contraceptives? And uh, uh, the answer is, patients experiencing a migraine without aura can safely use uh, or estrogen containing contraceptives, including pills, patches, or rings. Uh, but usually, patients with auras like this patient are generally not candidates for a hormone secreting contraceptive. Um, uh, actually, the studies are still not very clear, but it's highly advised that these patients avoid them. The absolute risk is, uh, of a stroke in these patients is relatively small, and we still have to look for and look and wait for more good quality studies to make a conclusion about. So there are a couple of foundations in the United States that help uh, people with migraine. The main one is the American Migraine Foundation. There are a lot of interesting articles and resources which we can look up. And uh, um, Migraine Research Foundation is another one. So uh, with that, I would like to conclude today's presentation. And I really thank Dr. Stein, Dr. Bernal, and Dr. Naka for giving this amazing learning opportunity. I thoroughly enjoyed this rotation. And and it was really great uh, working and learning from you all. Thank you so much.